So we are going to ask a couple pre and post questions uh, or pre question. Uh, one of them is I am aware of creative ways to combat traffic issues in my neighborhood. Um, if you definitely are aware, uh, go ahead and select A. If you are mostly aware, go ahead and select the letter B. Uh, if you're not sure, that's letter C. Mostly not is D and definitely not is E. So uh, looks like we probably just about good here. Uh, a couple more folks chiming in. All right. And our second evaluation question, I know how to get involved in traffic taming advocacy in Flint. So um, sort of building off of uh, Teresa's presentation the other night in the panel's uh, discussion, on advocacy, um, we'd like to know if you know how to get involved in this type of advocacy here in Flint. Uh, definitely yes is A, mostly yes is B, not sure is C, mostly not is D, and definitely not is E. Uh, and it looks like um, maybe based on the title of this presentation, people are mostly sure where to go. Um, but also uh, looks like we're pretty evenly mixed with the um, not sure and mostly not. So um, with that, I will go ahead and throw it over to Cade. And Cade, please let me know if, uh, if the remote is working for you. And if not, I can just go ahead and, and move through the slides myself. Hi, everyone. Um, I do, Michael, I do have the remote up. So once I see the presentation on my screen, I'll know if it's working or not. But um, hi, everyone. My name is Cade Surface uh, with the Crim Fitness Foundation. I'm a resident of Flint, um, a big walker and biker person, and I know that I've worked with many of you uh, over the past several years doing this type of work. So I'm always happy for an opportunity to chat with you about uh, the stuff that I care a lot about. Um, like Michael said, uh, Kate and Michelle are also here for this presentation. Um, uh, I have a few slides here, Kate and Michelle, but I will let you know when I've added yours on the end to uh, pass it off to you guys. So a couple of things before we get too deep into here. Um, when we talk about like the, the term traffic safety in particular, um, there's a lot of valid ways to discuss safety on our streets. Um, today, we're specifically talking about traffic violence or concerns about our safety as it relates to cars, um, not necessarily about like violent crimes on the streets. That's also very important and is obviously integral in order for us to feel safe walking and biking in our neighborhoods, but today we're mostly talking about the role of cars and design. Um, I also want to give the disclaimer that I'm not like a anti-car person. I come from a GM fam family. I enjoy driving. I was really excited when I got my first car as a teenager, but um, I also think that sometimes we prioritize cars a little bit too much when we're doing neighborhood work and city work uh, to the point where um, it really can uh, mess with our health. It's definitely messes with our finances, our ability to be independent and socially connected. Um, another point I wanted to, to start off with is that walking costs us collectively a lot less than driving does. Uh, I like the statistic that every time a resident drives, so anytime you go to the grocery store, go to see a friend, uh, get in your car to go to work, on average, that costs the community $9.20. And that's not just like street maintenance stuff, that's also all of the services that have had to been, you know, built around auto culture. So things like uh, increased policing and ambulances, all that stuff. Uh, just for a comparison, when a resident walks to the grocery store or something like that, it typically costs the community only one penny. Um, a third of Americans don't drive, don't have a license. Pedestrian death rates are at their highest rate in 30 years. 40,000 people die every year from automobile crashes. and this last one is also, I think, maybe the most important for me when I'm visualizing this. Our streets are our largest sort of shared physical resource in the city of Flint. So we have more square footage in our city that's dedicated to streets than we do to parks or to schools or to civic buildings, things like that. So um, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing, but I am saying that because this is our biggest shared resource that we should be making sure that those are usable and safe for all people, not just the people that are trying to get from point A to point B really quickly uh, from behind the steering wheel. 
All right, uh, I would love to play this video if possible. In 2015, an urban planner in Arkansas created this meme. Which street is safer? They're both residential streets with a 20 mile per hour speed limit. But while this street was designed to be more forgiving to drivers, this is actually the safer street. So why have we been building so many streets like this one over the past 50 years? In 2017, traffic deaths hit a 25-year high of 40,000 fatalities. 6,000 of those killed were pedestrians. Cities across the country are trying to reduce traffic fatalities with safety campaigns. And one of the keys to the whole problem might be a flawed mid-century design philosophy. There was a big transportation safety movement in the 1960s. This is when we saw the development of airbags and crash tests. In 1965, Ralph Nader published a book about the designed in dangers of cars and roads. He accused car companies of resisting safety improvements in order to cut costs. The book was a bestseller. It led to Senate hearings, which then led to the creation of the Department of Transportation, which eventually led to the creation of the National Highway Safety Administration. There were two key testimonies during congressional safety hearings in 1966 that paved the way for a flawed approach to street design. One was Ralph Nader, where our safety laws had previously been about enforcing safe driving behaviors, like following the speed limit, Nader's testimony led to a shift in thinking. He said, even if people have accidents, even if they make mistakes, even if they are looking out the window or they are drunk, we should have a second line of defense for these people. The sequence of events that leads to an accident injury can be broken by engineering measures even before there is a complete understanding of the causal chain. The other key testimony came from a senior engineer at General Motors. Ken Stonex helped GM design a so-called crash-proof highway test site called the Proving Ground. What happens when a front tire blows at 90 miles an hour? Let's find out. Perfect control, basic built-in stability. The proving ground had wide clearances, 100 feet on either side of the roadway, as a safety measure for drivers. Crash data from the proving ground showed that most cars that ran off the road came to a stop within 30 feet. The committee at the hearing seized on this data. One of the main sources of traffic fatalities at the time was single vehicles running off the road and colliding with a fixed object like a tree or light post. Stonex testified that we should operate 90% or more of our surface streets just as we do our freeways and that we should convert streets to proving ground, road, and roadside conditions. By 1967, the 30-foot clear zone was adopted into the official standard for road design. The Nader and Stonex testimonies reflect a bigger idea called forgiving design. The thinking goes, no driver is infallible, mistakes will be made. So let's design our roads and streets with that in mind to be as forgiving as possible when a driver does make inevitable errors. They've got plenty of room to regain control. The critical flaw in this thinking? This design doesn't account for how drivers would adjust their behavior in a forgiving environment. A forgiving environment has wide, clear shoulders, wide, straight travel ways, high visibility. But when you drive on a street like this, something happens. Your brain perceives this as a safe environment. So even if the posted speed limit is 20 miles an hour, that subconscious feeling of safety means your speed tends to creep up and up. And if you remember driver's ed, you remember speed kills. He always drove too fast, and that's what caused the accident. When you're hit by a car going 20 miles an hour, nine out of 10 times you'll survive. But as speed increases, the numbers get pretty grim. 
So urbanists and safety advocates are trying to get us to think about how we can slow drivers down when we're not on highways. Streets like this one with its tree canopy and narrow lanes were actually outlawed when the forgiving design movement took hold. This street looks and feels more hazardous to a driver. You don't have great visibility, you have to weave around parked cars in a narrow lane. Sensing the inherent risk in the environment, you tend to take things a little slower no matter what the posted speed limit says. Does this mean that Stonex's proving ground data was totally wrong? Not at all. But he and other transportation engineers collapsed an important distinction. There's a difference between roads and streets. Roads are simply about connecting two places. They're designed to facilitate speedy, efficient movement. Streets are about building place and economic value. And so, over the last decade, urbanists have begun to call into question the old forgiving design philosophy. Forgiving design is forgiving to drivers at high speeds on highways and arterial roads, but it's not the safest design for urban streets where you've also got to think about pedestrians and cyclists. It's a case of the design not matching up with the use. But now that urbanists have pointed out the problem, we're starting to see a return to design elements that subconsciously encourage drivers to take it slow. Perfect. Okay. So I like to share that video because that lady does a better job of explaining all of this stuff than I ever could. But what I would like to do is take some of those lessons and apply them toward our neighborhood context here in the city of Flint. Um, so a couple of key takeaways from that video. Um, in the 1960s, the United States Department of Transportation adopted this new policy called forgiving design that they referenced. Ralph Nader's uh, it really pushed for this type of design when he was realizing how many people were dying behind the wheel. And uh, this resulted in uh, us designing streets that are wide with super um, uh, easy turns and things like that, basically our expressways, right? Um, but it didn't just stay on the expressways, it went to our first our arterial streets, like for example, Miller Road or Court Street or Dort Highway. And then eventually it even went into our small neighborhood streets where all of us live, where even where our schools and our parks are. Um, so remember that this forgiving design philosophy, while 100% based in science, it, it did not take into account anybody except for the person that was in the car. So the people that were in the car were a lot safer, they were less likely to die, but the people that were uh, playing baseball next to the next to the road or crossing the street, uh, their rates have been uh, of death have been increasing ever since. So here is the GM proving grounds in Milford. So uh, uh, Milford or Warren, I can't remember where that is. Anyway, um, uh, this was referenced in the video. So believe it or not, like this was the first example of this type of road design. So and this was designed by General Motors to basically come up with the perfect environment for their cars to be safe. So what do we see here? We see really wide streets with really easy turns. I only see one example of true right turns in this entire thing. And we even have examples of uh, multiple uh, sort of easy turns to get to the same street. So it's a very um, easy driving experience. And I think if we look at maps of our community, you could totally see where the influence of this has trickled down into our own neighborhoods. So here's an example of a flip neighborhood. Uh, what do we see here? We see some really gently curving streets. Uh, we see, um, we do see some right angles, but not all of these are right angles. And of course we know that these streets are relatively wide. So we have these two different kinds of design philosophies. The forgiving design on the left, again, is what we've been talking about. It's all about making it as safe as possible for a car to run off the road and not injure the people in the car. Forgiveness of slow speeds on the right hand, that's street design that really encourages vehicles to go slowly. So you can see the different elements of both of these designs on both sides. So when we're doing our forgiving design or our typical sort of suburban or highway design, wide lanes, often multiple lanes, broad, smooth curves, a clear zone free of fixed objects. So if we think of, again, Dort Highway or Miller Road, uh, you've got your big wide road and then your buildings are pushed way, way, way out, right? So even if you do spin out and go onto the side of the road, you're not going to hit anything. Um, the issue with this, just as the video showed, 
was that this provides a sense of safety for the motorists that makes them comfortable going faster. And almost always, if you have cars that are going faster and you don't have other conditions around it, it's going to cause more deaths of people that aren't actually in the cars. Okay, so uh, actually we can, we can uh, pass this one. I've already explained this one to death, I think. Okay, so um, I wanted to also pull this chart out. Um, this is really important for us to note. Uh, out, uh, a car that hits a pedestrian going 20 miles per hour, there's only a 10% chance that, that pedestrian is going to die. That bumps up to a 50% chance that that car is going 30 miles per hour and a 90% chance that that car is going 40 miles per hour. Uh, for a lot of the streets in our community, 40 miles per hour doesn't seem that high, right? We have streets where people regularly go 55, 60. We have our expressways. We know that even on our neighborhood streets, people tend to go pretty fast. So um, I think when we're talking about speeds, we really need to realize how low of a threshold it really is when we're talking about fatalities. This is the kind of the example that kicked the video off. Um, I imagine that there's a lot of people on this call that live in neighborhoods that look like the top and a lot of us that live in neighborhoods that look like the bottom because Flint is a relatively old city. Uh, there was a lot of city that was built um, kind of uh, before World War II. And then after World War II, a lot of the neighborhoods were built like the example on the top. So um, while it's certainly, uh, we certainly have speeding issues in every neighborhood and in every street type, we know that the street design that's shown on the top of this screen um, just mentally encourages people to drive faster, even though they both have a posted speed limit a 20 miles per hour and theoretically there would be police enforcement and things like that um, encouraging folks to go 20 miles per hour as well. All right, now I wanted to bring some examples that were true to my life. I grew up in Gaines Township, uh, so just at uh, the, the furthest reach of Genesee County. Uh, where I grew up was actually so rural that uh, Google um, Street View doesn't even go there, so I had to find this nearby subdivision to use as an example. Um, I wanted to point out here that this is a neighborhood that's often um, referred to as walkable. Uh, it's referred to as safe for walkers. And I would assume that's because there's a sidewalk here. That's why they would call it walkable. But if you look at the width of the street, if you look at how far away the houses are set from the street, uh, and you also look at how easy and broad that curve is, you see that there's still a lot of those elements of forgiving design of that uh, GM Proving Grounds design that was referenced in the earlier slides. All right, so when I wasn't in Gaines Township growing up, I was up north uh, living with my grandparents in St. Helen for half of the year for most of my childhood. And up north, it looked a lot like this. So this was the street that I walked to and biked to to get to the beach or to visit my friends every day. Um, there are no sidewalks up here, uh, but uh, we had to walk and bike everywhere we went. This felt very safe. And you can actually see even from this uh, street view image, there are people even walking here. So even though this street doesn't have those elements that we typically think of as promoting walkability, things like sidewalks or crosswalks or street lighting even, uh, this still is sort of seen as safe. And I don't remember there ever being a, an accident with a, with a pedestrian in any of my time up here because the design of the street is just inherently encourages folks to go slow, right? We have a narrow street, we have sheds and houses and cottages up against the street. Uh, we have a gravel surface that encourages people to go slowly. So this is, these are kind of extreme examples of how the actual design and materials of the street uh, can actually make it a safer place and a more comfortable place for people to be able to walk or bike. And I would say that walking and biking is still the main mode of transportation for most of the folks in, uh, in this part of that town. Cool, so here's the Miller Road example. Uh, I don't want to beat this to death, but here we go. We have what? We have five lanes plus a turning lane plus this huge shoulder. Uh, the actual businesses are, uh, you know, a hundred feet away from the from the uh, the street. In some examples, the only thing that's up by the street are the signs. So what we have here is essentially just the design for a racetrack, right? So I'm sure all of us have been driving down Miller Road and we've seen some poor, sad person trying to cross that street. It's happened to me a hundred times or someone waiting at the bus stop and like how inherently unsafe that street design is for anybody to walk around. Uh, so despite this being sort of a commercial center of our county really, um, it's really only made to service people to take care of people who are behind the wheel. Here's obviously the polar opposite of that, another commercial center 
but that's clearly built for multimodal. I don't think I have to sing the praises of, um, you know, a, a downtown style development for walkability to this group. So we can go to the next slide. All right, now I'm gonna talk about just this term traffic calming. Traffic calming is a method used to slow speeds or reduce traffic counts in certain sections of roadway. It's most often used in areas that experience consistent excessive speeds, cut through traffic, or where there's a high ratio of pedestrians to vehicles. So the idea here is taking our streets and putting in changes, installations, whatever, to change, slow down the rates of speed, or in some cases to just reduce the number of cars that are even accessing that street. Um, it's important to note that roads with higher speeds of traffic take way more protective infrastructure to be safe and walkable. So that dirt road example I gave is the perfect example of this. Because that road is narrow and only allows for people to go pretty slow, um, we didn't need any infrastructure there. We didn't even need sidewalks or lights in order for that to be a safe place for people to walk. But this example here on Lennon Road, um, out, I think this is in Flint Township, yeah. Um, you see we've got a four lane and a turning lane street here. Uh, and where the uh, pedestrian crossing is, we have all of these signs. We have uh, special painted uh, crosswalks, additional signs. There's even a traffic island built into the middle of the lane. So that way pedestrians can wait there while the rest of the traffic goes by. So all of this uh, uh, expense and effort had to be put in in order just to make this section of street safe to, in order to calm the traffic enough to make it safe for people to walk here. So there's a large expense associated with making um, pedestrian safe on streets that aren't designed for them. Uh, so uh, the, the best way to slow down speeds is introducing visible risk into the environment. So this, uh, when we introduce visible risk into the environment, that means that vehicles, people that are driving are sensing a risk in the environment. So they tend to take things slower, no matter what the speed limit says. So this example on the screen here is an example of of a road diet that occurred here in the city of Flint. This is University Avenue, kind of in front of DTM school. Uh, and about 15 years ago, uh, an effort was made by the city to slow down traffic on this street. And so they, in, they uh, installed all of these things like in and along the roadway. So they, first of all, they narrowed the street. They reduced the number of lanes. They bumped out the sidewalks. They put in this traffic island, this um, boulevard island with trees in the middle. They installed lights and trees on the sides. They painted crosswalks. All of this stuff uh, visibly shows a driver that this is not a racetrack, right? This is a place where there are pedestrians, where there are people, uh, that it's not just a place for cars to exist. Uh, and there are examples of this all over the city. And of course, in lots of cities. Um, a great visualization of visible, of visible risk is snow, right? So we all know that when it snows in our neighborhoods, cars tend to go a lot slower. So that's because there's literally something in the street that's causing them to feel less safe driving at a, at a higher rate of speed. Another wonderful thing about snow, and you, as you can see in this example, is that when cars drive through snow, you see how little real estate a car actually needs in order to get from point A to point B. So you can see everywhere here where there's this white piled up snow, that's, that is roadway, that's roadway in this neighborhood, but it's roadway that wasn't actually necessary in order for this neighborhood to function. Um, and when we have excess roadway, again, people tend to drive faster. So if uh, a traffic engineer was looking at this example and thinking of ways to calm traffic, to introduce visible risk, they would probably look at all of these places where there is snow built up and they would put things in like, uh, like put some grass or some parking spaces or bump out the sidewalk. All these are all options as you know demonstrated by this example. All right, next slide. Um, next slide. Uh, next one too. Okay, so on street parking is a great way to uh, introduce visible risks and narrow down the street. So these are two streets in the Carriage Town neighborhood. Mason Street on the left doesn't have any uh, on-street parking. It's also a one-way. So again, pretty close to racetrack like uh, 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 environment and people tend to go pretty fast on that street. I can attest to it because I live on that street. People go very, very fast. Uh, one street over here is Lion Street where it's two ways, uh, two-way traffic and there's on-street parking and we the traffic tends to be much, much slower on that street. So um, one of the reasons for this is again, if you have cars parked on the side of the street and traffic coming the other direction, that narrows kind of that safe zone that a driver is comfortable driving in and slows down traffic and makes it safer for pedestrians and cyclists. 
Yep, crosswalks are a nice obvious sort of classic example. Um, so on the bottom left here, we have where there clearly used to be a crosswalk, but it's pretty faded. And on the top, we have a uh, brand new, uh, we call this a high visibility crosswalk. So there's a little bit more paint on this style of crosswalk than all of them. Um, a quick caveat here, a quick notice. Um, there's always a lot of energy and excitement around um, different things we can do with crosswalks when I have these conversations. And believe me, I am excited about those things too. Um, just know that the city of Flint is not really ready to approve, formally approve a crosswalk that uh, doesn't look like either this or like just the double bar style of crosswalk. Know that we are working on that uh, at multiple levels, at federal, state, and local levels to try to um, see if we can make that a more acceptable option in our neighborhoods. But in the meantime, just your classic crosswalks are still a great tool because they not only really show where pedestrians are supposed to be and alert cars to the fact that they're entering a shared pedestrian space, uh, but they also you know, let cars know where they need to stop and they, again, introduce that visible risk. Next slide. All right, tightening corners. This is one of my favorite ways, and this is a thing that the city has done before. So in both of these examples, you can kind of see at the sidewalk uh, where the corner of that street used to be. So we have a big wide corner. And when you have wide, easy corners, people can whip right around those corners in cars. They can go really fast. So in both of these cities, you can see that they extended uh, those corners, uh, the pedestrian space on those corners, and they made the turning radius on the street. I know this sounds kind of technical, but I promise it's not. Um, so if you, uh, if the cars don't, uh, aren't able to turn quite so fast, they often will have to stop because they're making a direct right turn. And so that means cars are slowing down. They're having to look a lot more uh, around themselves for people like pedestrians and other vehicles. And it also has the added benefit of shortening the crossing distance for pedestrians as they're crossing the street. Um, so this is one of my favorite ways to slow down traffic, especially in residential neighborhoods. All right, increasing signage. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. All right, and before I kick it off to the rest of my team, I just wanted to introduce the Traffic Taming Task Force for Michelle. The Traffic Taming Task Force is a group of uh, committed residents who are all concerned about uh, the safety risks associated with um, high rates of speed uh, and folks not obeying traffic laws on our neighborhood streets. It's their goal to reduce the rates of injury and death on Flint streets and sidewalks. Um, this group meets uh, on the first Monday of most months. They collect accident reports from around the city and compile them onto maps for uh, neighborhood residents to use when they're examining their own neighborhoods. Uh, the group researches examples of effective traffic calming treatments in other communities, kind of back to that uh, colorful uh, crosswalk example. Um, this group also uh, does a lot of data collection and training uh, with the speed radar sign um, and uh, some other data sets that, that Michelle will explain to you. Uh, and this group also uh, offers trainings on how to, um, how to use all of these tools and how to advocate for, for all these sort of traffic and street-based changes in your own neighborhoods. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Michelle. All right, thank you, Kate. And uh, thank you, Michael, for pulling that up. Uh, so hi, my name is Michelle Kahelski, and I am a neighborhood liaison for the Neighborhood Engagement Hub, and I help to support the Traffic Taming Task Force in Neighborhood Traffic Calming. Um, so I'm going to be sharing with you a couple slides of um, some ways that we have been involving local Flint residents to engage promoting safer streets and neighborhoods. Um, next, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so traffic taming has really tried to incorporate a lot of the comments and concerns that our members and residents have expressed at our meetings and in past uh, in the past couple of years, such as advocacy um, and promoting change. Uh, people specifically mentioned wanting to be trained to make public comment at city council meetings or, or assistance with writing formal letters. So the Traffic Taming Task Force is actually available to work for the groups one-on-one -on -one to identify those needs and changes, um, if the group would like, uh, of course. We do host monthly meetings, as Kate mentioned, on the first Monday of each month uh, via Zoom to highlight current traffic data. Um, and allow for public comment. But we will not be meeting um, in April because we do wanna be respectful of the upcoming Easter holiday. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and just a little bit about our speed signs. Uh, some of you may have seen our speed signs um, on the east side near Dexter and Davison um, along Saginaw Street next to uh, University Park Estates, uh, the Ballinger Highway area. 
Um, and Miller Road, just to name a few. So any Flint resident uh, or neighborhood group uh, is eligible to receive the sign as long as they are willing to commit to um, three months of data collection um, and general sign maintenance. Uh, so members uh, using the sign, they can receive high speed alerts um, and they have access to view the data, the speed data, and they can view it by day. Um, if they know that, you know, uh, Monday is particularly busy, they can view the information to see what day is busiest in their neighborhood. Um, or they can do it by hour. So it is customizable depending on the need of the neighborhood group. Our sign there as well. Um, and, and with the, the speed radar sign, we would ask that you contact one of the uh, technical consultants with traffic taming to pick the best possible location. Um, we have learned in the past that, you know, sign placement is very critical to collecting accurate data. Um, and members are going to be changing the batteries. So we'll teach you how to. Um, how to change batteries, how to take down the speed sign, how to adjust the settings. Um, and we do also have two speed signs now. So one is solar. So we are able to operate in two neighborhoods now at a time. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so neighborhoods that participate in data collection with the speed signs, they're also encouraged to conduct walking audits in their uh, area or around recreational spaces. Um, and the purpose of the walking audit is to provide an assessment of walkability uh, or pedestrian access around um, a particular area or neighborhood. Uh, walking audits are generally, generally good for um, promoting the needs of the residents. We do recommend that you involve other residents of your neighborhood, people of different ages, mobility types, um, to create um, a map that can display outcomes or suggestions. Um, and this will aid residents um, with the skills and knowledge to suggest placemaking techniques, uh, for making pedestrian entrance points a lot more safer and attractive. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is something we're also encouraging uh, participants to do in addition with the walking audit. Uh, we do want each neighborhood group to advocate um, for you know, uh, traffic calming implementations and the traffic taming task force is available to meet with neighborhood residents um, in making public comments if they're willing to uh, speak with city council members. Uh, we will aid in helping you to write a formal letter or uh, give you suggestions in writing a formal letter. And we will also uh, be available to help you practice public speaking. Um, so if you're wanting to go to a city council meeting and you want to, you know, practice your pitch, we're available and we're there to give you comments and suggestions. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I, I guess that was it. Uh, so that's all I have. If anyone is interested in attending the next meeting, please let me know in the chat or send me an email. Um, and although the group technically does meet once a month, um, Kate and myself uh, are available to meet with residents outside of that time to answer questions or talk about some of the experiences that you have been having in your neighborhood. So thank you. Great. All right, uh, next up is Kate. Um, so Kate, uh, once you're uh, off mute, you can just let Michael know when you want him to go to the next slide and uh, take it away. Okay, can you hear me? Right. Um, the one of our missions for the ta uh, tra taming traffic task force is to instill a respect for law and life. And you know, unfortunately, I can't say in the last two years since we've been measuring the speeds of traffic in different neighborhoods, I have to say that we have a pandemic throughout the city. There's not one area that we haven't found uh, people respecting the law or life. And um, this is a big problem. So go to the next slide and I'll tell you why I'm saying these things with some figures. When we got the sign to Miller Road, I believe that was our sixth neighborhood that we went into we found vehicles traveling over 75 miles an hour, 52 of them in 30 days. And the speed limit there was 35 miles an hour. So if you go back and think about what Cade was saying, your chances of surviving being as a pedestrian, being hit by a vehicle traveling over 40 miles an hour is one tenth of a percent figure out your chances at 75 plus. 
Now, Miller Road really opened our eyes to a lot of 18 vehicles going over 80 plus and eight vehicles going over 90 plus in 30 days. Uh, we had the highest rate was 107 miles an hour. And that was at 4.53 in the afternoon. So there are people walking, kids riding bikes. And why we're very concerned about this is that there's no enforcement. We're on our eighth site right now. Next site, slide, please. Um, our first site was on the east side in Dexter Street, and we were just learning how to use the, the machine. But when we got to Pingali Road, where Windigate Park is, we found that 53% of the traffic is over the speed limit. Now, these are, this is where the kids are traveling to the park and riding their bikes. And we found that even though there's not a lot of traffic there, 39 vehicles per day are at high risk. And then we went on to North Grand Traverse area and that also was a horrific. 70% of the traffic is over the speed limit. 345 vehicles a day are at high risk. Next slide, please. And then I talked about Miller Road. Currently, and I know Chad is on this on this call, and he's been uh, Chad has been doing our maintenance on our sign in Mott Park, and seventy percent of the vehicles are over the speed limit, and three hundred and thirty four vehicles per day at high risk. Now, would you want your kid to ride a bicycle there? We're also going to be moving the sign to Dupont Street beginning the week of April fifth. We've also, next slide, please. Uh, we've also had heard from the area around DuPont Street and McClellan that there's a lot of red light running. And um, all of these, this bad data really needs good enforcement. Uh, the state of Iowa uses cameras now to track people who are running red lights. And in Sioux City, Iowa, they had 12,000 people that got tickets. Can you imagine? Those cameras were paid for <laughs> with 12,000 tickets <laughs> and the city made little money. Uh, so we, we have lots of things to advocate for. I'm, a, I'm an advocate of using technology to enforce our laws until people get accustomed to saying, I can't drive that fast on a neighborhood street. Next slide, please. And then the other area that we're very concerned about is distracted driving. And we just heard today in the news that more pedestrians were killed in uh, traffic accidents in the year 2020 than ever before. Distracted driving kills more people than drunk driving. And we want to educate our people too about the dangers of, of distracted driving. So that's the information that we're collecting. Now we want you to help us to take that information to people who can make a difference. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, Kate. So yeah, just to wrap all of that up. Oh, sorry, it looks like you had another slide here, Kate. Oh, no, that's it. <laughs> okay, that's it. That okay. was our old one, yeah. Got it, okay. Um, so just to wrap this up, uh, Kate gave us all of this data that is being collected by the speed radar sign and, um, and Michelle kind of talked about the process of getting it. Uh, the whole idea is to make sure that we are arming, uh, we are arming neighborhoods and residents with the data that they need to advocate for themselves, right? So. I don't think anybody in the city uh, needs to be convinced that there's a speeding problem, right? That anybody you talk to knows that that if, it, if it's not their street, it's a street near them that feels dangerous. Uh, but what we didn't always have was real data to work from. So um, we want to be able to offer that uh, and some training to go along with it so that you can, you know, go through the democratic process and, and advocate for the things that you want. Um, I did get uh, a note saying that there are some aspects of these things that we talked about, some of these, um, especially the, uh, the treatments on the streets where we're bumping out sidewalks and doing other treatments like that, that the city uh, isn't necessarily used to doing, right? So in some cases, the city will allow things like wider sidewalks or bump outs or crosswalks 
in like a downtown area or in front of a school, but they're not really used to doing that yet in neighborhoods. So it's not just about saying, hey, I have a solution. It's about really kind of asking your council people, uh, asking your mayor, asking anybody you can to take some of these things seriously and look into them and also lean into some of the research that we're trying to provide uh, so that there's a wider range of options to keep us safe on our streets. Um, and with that, I will uh, pass it off to questions. All right, so Kate, I'm gonna um, moderate the questions and we do have a few here. Um, so it's about a quarter or two. So for everybody who has questions, we, we may not be able to get to everybody today. Um, so please, uh, if, you, if, we're not, if we don't get to your question, um, please feel free to email Cade or Michelle directly and ask for some support or ask your question. Um, and they will also connect you with Kate if, if that's the next step for you. But Michelle is helping with that communication with Kate so that she's not getting emails from a ton of people. Uh, <laughs> so please work with them. Um, and Mark, I do see your hand up. So I am gonna, uh, we do have questions from like four other people. So we, I don't know if we'll get to everybody. Um, so Mark, if I don't get to you, that's why, because um, we've got four other questions. So the first question we had during your presentation, um, Edna um, asked about, um, sorry, I'm just gonna write down Mark's name real quick here. So I don't, so if your hand goes down, I remember. Um, so Edna asked about buildings being close to the street. So uh, she asked, did, does that help with uh, reducing speeds of traffic, you know, having buildings close to the road and having parking in, a, in the back? Um, what, what is your experience with that or your recommendation around that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think Michael, as an urban designer, can probably speak to this as well. Um, but when we create, well, it's called a street wall, right? So when, there's, when there are uh, objects sort of close to that driving surface, um, it makes you feel enclosed and it tends to make you slow down. It also tends to be more interesting. So you want to slow down for that reason too. Um, also, it's great for pedestrians because the thing that you're trying to get to, the shop or whatever, is a lot closer to you than if you have to walk across this huge parking lot. So um, you could really tell with those examples of Miller Road and Saginaw Street how the, um, the geography of the way we built our communities really flipped in the mid-century. And I'm sure folks that have been around the city for a long time witnessed that themselves. I will say though that a good like um, a quicker kind of fix that you can do if, if you don't feel like uh, reconstructing your entire neighborhood, uh, things like street trees, uh, street lamps, um, all of those things are a great way to, to, uh, to introduce visible risk and, um, and narrow the, the street. Thank you. Uh, did anybody else on the, the team, um, Michelle or Kate, want to speak to that? No. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are like, he did it. <laughs> okay. Um, the other question was from Chad. Uh, he was curious if you guys were having meetings with John Daly and how that was going. Yep. If, if <laughs> Kate, do you want to take that one? Oh, you're, uh, you're unmuted. And I did, I did let him know that I knew the group had met with John at least a few times. So okay. yes, and he did introduce us to other people that would be helpful to share this information with. So yes, we have contacted him. Yep, he was very compelled by the data that we had, and he's, um, yeah, he was excited about that. Thank you. Uh, and then we had a question from Liddell. Uh, uh, it just said cameras and speed bumps. Question mark. So are those options? Uh, for reducing traffic in, in the neighborhoods or, um, and I, I figure that might be a Cade question because I- sure. So talk. those are absolutely treatments that communities use all over the country and all over the world. Um, those, the usage of those in the city of Flint is a matter of, of policy. It's prevented by the policies of the city. So by and large, speed bumps are not allowed. Uh, they give a myriad of concerns. Sometimes it's referring to snow plows. Sometimes it's referring to any number of other things, but um, so that's a thing where we would have to, uh, we would have to, as residents, ask uh, the folks that are making those decisions to possibly reconsider. There's also something called a speed hump, uh, which is a little bit different than a speed bump. It's a little bit wider of a table. That tends to be a little bit um, easier on things like snow plowing equipment and stuff like that, uh, and still slows cars down. Same thing with cameras. Kate was referring to Iowa and the camera system that works there. Um, currently in Michigan, you can have traffic cameras, but I believe you can't ticket based off of those traffic cameras. So 
uh, that's a policy at the Lansing level that prevents uh, those from being fully utilized. So if that system is something that you and your neighbors think would would be a good thing to have here in the city, then you know your work cuts, is cut out for you. You need to do some advocacy and some research and ask uh, your, your lawmakers at the state level to um, reconsider that. Thank you. Uh, and then um, oh, and just to kind of piggyback off of that a little bit. So that goes back to, again, that session that we just recently had about advocacy, how it works, having a plan, having the data, doing your homework. Um, and so a lot of what they're talking about is they're doing their homework. They're collecting that data and collecting that data and collecting it, even if uh, things maybe aren't moving as quick as they uh, as we all want it to. They're, they have that data and they have the information and now they've got the people power and are coming together to say, we wanna see some changes. So it goes back to that, you know, having a plan. Um, and then Vanessa uh, asked, you know, uh, is there a possibility for these signs to be located outside of Flint, uh, potentially in Burton? Uh, <laughs> and so I, I will answer that question. Um, <laughs> Uh, so with the traffic taming task force, uh, probably no, I'm looking at Kate and Michelle and, and Kate around the TTTF, I believe is focused specifically on Flint as it, as it currently is, is designed. However, we have a group called Safe and Active Genesee for Everyone, and that group addresses things throughout the county. So I would encourage you, if you are not a Flint resident, but you are seeing all these awesome things happening in Flint and you know that, you know, other communities, uh, especially like Burton or, or uh, you know, other communities that are similar to, to Flint in terms of economic issues and speed and stuff. Um, we, we really encourage you to join that group and start thinking of ways that we can replicate what the group is doing here in Flint. So, um, so uh, Kate, Kate and Michelle, did I answer that? Okay. Yeah. All right. So I just wanted to <laughs> make sure. Oh, everything we do, we have to get approval from the city. Every place that we place the uh, radar sign in has to be approved by the city. So we work closely with them and Miss Dig. Uh, so uh, there's a lot that goes into it at the city level. Mm -hmm. And just a, just a point of information for the folks, because we also had a question about um, uh, how the information is gathered. I think somebody came in a little late on the presentation. Um, and so they were asking like, how do you even get this data? So there is a speed radar sign for anybody who came in, you know, halfway through the presentation at all or, or got kicked out because of technology issues. Um, it is a speed radar sign that is installed um, and the CRIM and NEH has been helping with training people on it um, and helping with the funding around it because we have to buy that and then we have to pay a subscription for the service where we collect the data. So a lot of this is grant funded through our Ruthmont Foundation grant fund, uh, grant right now. Um, but again, you know, thinking about different solutions. If we think back to some of our previous sessions, I like to always go back. I like to to give little nods to our previous sessions. So you know, thinking about crowdfunding, thinking about grant writing, thinking about seeing if you can get maybe a company to sponsor it, you know, so there's a lot of options, but um, that is one of the things to just keep in mind as well. So that's, that's why a coalition like working with Kate and Michelle and Kate is really powerful because a little bit of cash goes a long way if you're working with a group. So that's why they rotate that sign throughout the community um, because it does cost money to have those signs. So we're really sharing resources across neighborhoods. So you know, it goes back to, again, some of our previous sessions about collaboration, working across neighborhoods, being involved and being open to partnering is really important. Uh, I want to add just a, a couple more points to that. So we, we currently actually have two signs that are uh, able to be in rotation. And we do have uh, uh, one neighborhood that's on the north side near Brown Home School that was really interested in having one. So they're working on a grant process right now to purchase their own. Uh, which would be theirs to keep in their neighborhood, but we would still be able to manage the data for it. So it would still be contributing to all of this. And the Carriagetown neighborhood where I actually live, we uh, enjoyed having the speed radar sign uh, in our neighborhood on Grand Traverse uh, a few rounds ago. And so we are also working on a grant to uh, try to buy our own. So if you, uh, if you want to get around the resources uh, to get your own, then um, instead of borrowing it for a short amount of time, then that's also an option. And you would still be able to take advantage of the resources of the traffic taming group. And if you do live near a, a, a community school, 
uh, I would suggest that you talk to that community school director and let them know that you're interested in one because they might be a source for some funds to purchase something like that as well. And we are, uh, we, we are gonna be at our time. So we have one more question from Mark. Uh, so I'd like us to uh, kind of wrap it up with our one que our question from Mark, you'll be our last person. Um, and then if anybody's interested in more information, again, make sure that you reach out to Cade or Michelle. And if you need to be connected with Kate, they'll get you there um, just to help her man not get a ton of emails. <laughs>